Churches used to be the centre for the community. They were open to all classes of society, and through their association with births, marriages and deaths, often had links to each stage in an individual's life. Add to that their open commemoration of the dead, and churches became a clear focal point in each parish. So it's hardly surprising that the folklore of churches is actually rather common. Many of these stories here also appear in similar versions around the country, which implies that people came up with very, very similar theories for strange or unexplained events. So grab a spade and let's dig into the folklore of churches and churchyards in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are moving on to the folklore of churches this week. And to be honest with you, I'll just tell you now, we are also looking at churches again next week because, again, I found out that there were so many different types of stories that it was really going to end up being a two-parter. So we're going to have a look at the more folkloric side of things this week and then we're going to have a look at ghost stories of churches next week because why not? We're going to get started straight away because I found loads for this episode, which is a good thing in my view. And we're going to start off with lost churches and tolling bells. Now, we have talked about the importance of church bells before. I mean, look at the Dick Whittington story where Bow Bells predict his future as London Mayor. And then there were loads of superstitions surrounding church bells and their ability to predict deaths depending on what's happening while they chime in the Folklore of Time episode. So this kind of starts to speak to an importance placed on church bells and so on. And the funny thing is, there are actually quite a lot of traditions of churches lost to the sea along the coast. And in these particular tales, these churches who've either slipped into the sea or there's been some kind of coastal erosion and the whole village is gone, the bells still ring at midnight or during storms. And this certainly makes for an atmospheric and evocative image. But there are also, strangely enough, these tales of entire lakes that had swallowed sinful villages, and in these stories the loss of the church is especially noted. So we're going to go to Bowmere and Showmere, a few miles south of Shrewsbury, for our first church-related story. Now, according to a local legend which was related by Charlotte Byrne in 1883, Bowmere was originally the site of a village sitting in a hollow. The villagers apparently turned their backs on Christianity and took up worship of Warden and Thor. The priest warned them no good would come of their behaviour, but they persisted, with the exception of a small band who continued to worship God in the chapel. One December, that had been far wetter than usual, the priest was gathering wood on the hillside when he noticed a bit of a problem. There was a dam that held back the nearby mere, but the water was beginning to overflow. So the priest ran down into the village, begging the men to go up there and cut a new channel to safely let the excess water out in a more directed way. The villagers refused as it was their winter festival and they accused the priest of trying to spoil their fun. The priest gave up trying to help them and went to his chapel. Despite the heavy rain, his flock gathered with him on Christmas Eve for their midnight mass. During the service, they heard an almighty roar before a mighty flood flowed into the church and it was so strong it actually washed away the building and the mayor flooded the village having breached the dam. People continue to claim that if you travelled over the mayor on Christmas Eve, you could hear the church bell tolling just after midnight. And on top of that, one legend claimed that if the neighbouring pools of Bowmere and Showmere ever met, the world would end. Now, Charlotte Byrne collected several stories that were variations on this same theme, and for one reason or another, a church either ended up at the bottom of the mayor or its bells did, and in both cases you could still hear them ringing at particular times or on specific days. And the focus upon the loss of the church underscores the apparent sinfulness of the village. So in this story, there's a little bit of an undercurrent that it was the villagers turning back to worshipping Warden and Thor that was the problem, not anything else. And then the priest just happens to be an unfortunate bystander. But then in other stories, the ground itself swallows churches. In Adillam in Norfolk, a deep hole apparently marked the site of a church that sank without trace. And then when oxen wandered across the ground, it swallowed them up too. Now, this sinkhole even has a name, and a Norfolk wise woman named Mrs Lubbock claimed it was called Seagama Hole and described it as a fairy's bay. 
Now, Seagar is apparently a Norse Viking surname meaning sea spear. So we then have to wonder, were the Vikings actually responsible for the loss of the church? And it's just kind of, that's been lost to the mists of time. Was it actually the fairies that caused the loss of the church? Or was it just a sinkhole? Now, sadly, it probably is the latter, since Norfolk does seem to be rather prone to sinkholes, but the name is still a fascinating remnant of the history in the area. And meanwhile, a hollow in the ground in Kirkby, Lonsdale and Westmoreland was also said to have been the site of a church, and people claimed that you could still hear bells ringing underground on a Sunday morning. And in some cases, Jacqueline Simpson and Jennifer Westwood suggest that these sorts of stories perhaps explain why certain parishes lacked a church for a long time, that it wasn't that they didn't have a church, it was just that something had happened to the church that they had. Now, where they remain standing, some churches actually become famous for their structural peculiarities, and naturally folklore grows up around these buildings to explain away these oddities. One obvious example would be the Twisted Spire in Chesterfield, and it belongs to the Church of St Mary and All Saints, a mostly 14th century church. The spire is 69 metres tall, and it's not just twisted, it actually leans out of true by about 2 metres. And nobody actually knows why, but a variety of stories have tried to explain it. And there's lots of variations on the theme, so I'll just give you two, and it kind of gives you an idea of the direction people are going in with these stories. But one of them is that the devil was sitting on the spire when a virtuous bride arrived for her wedding and he essentially twisted while he was sitting on the spire to follow her progress into the church and thus twisted the spire as he moved. An alternative version sees him sitting on the spire, this time with his tail curled around the spire and when some incense from the church below made him sneeze and his convulsion when he sneezed was what caused the spire to twist. Now, there is a far more prosaic theory, which in all honesty is probably far more likely to be true. And here, the combination of unseasoned timber and lead plate cladding essentially created a really poor distribution of weight. And that then led to the twist. Obviously, that's not as good a story, though. All Saints at Beebe in Leicestershire boasts a stump of a spire on its tower. And various legends explain why it's only a stump and not a full spire but most of them seem to boil down to a pair of brothers. Now, they built the spire at nearby Quenebra, and they argued over the costs and the possibility of getting all saints people to actually stay upright. Their disagreement turned into a fight while they were on the tower, and then they fell off the tower and died. The stub is also known as Beebe's Tub, and this is just one example of a story trope in which the builder died during construction. So there's quite a few of these around the country where... During building, for some reason, there was either a fight and someone fell off, or in other variations, the master jumps to his death when his apprentice builds a superior church. It was actually quite surprising how many stories followed that particular route, and it does seem to therefore explain why something remains unfinished. The church in Perton, Wiltshire, on the other hand, has two towers, one at the west end and then a central tower with a spire. And according to legend, two sisters paid for the building. They couldn't agree on the design, so they had a tower each to satisfy their design tastes. Now, this is unfortunately unlikely because the spire dates to the late 14th century and the tower is from the late 15th century, but it still makes a good story. And Covington's All Saints Church near Huntington apparently had a spire that was destroyed by Oliver Cromwell. During work on the church, they did indeed find evidence that the tower could have held a spire. Sadly, if it did, it would have been pulled down around 1500. And this is perhaps symptomatic of legends that testify to Cromwell's apparently ubiquitous presence around England. So we've looked at the idea of twisted spires, we've looked at why churches have more towers than they should or the tower's not finished, but there are in some cases churches which actually have bell towers that are detached from the main building. And the Church of St Augustine in Brooklyn, Kent is probably the most famous for having a detached bell tower. And according to this legend, local couples in the area had stopped getting married, preferring instead to simply live together. Eventually, a young couple visited the vicar to ask about having a wedding, and the tower was so excited about the idea of having a wedding that it jumped down so it could see the pair. And this also links with the legends about Chesterfield, and the idea is basically that the locals are so immoral, a virtuous couple is a surprise, and in this case then leads to the architecture itself changing. Likewise, the Church of St Mary the Virgin at East Burghall in Suffolk also has a detached bell house. And in this legend, the devil apparently kept pulling down the work done on the tower at night where the bells were supposed to be housed. The workmen gave up and constructed a separate wooden bell house instead. 
Now, in reality, the village actually started work on a bell tower for the church in 1525. Cardinal Wolsey's downfall meant that funds dried up and the building work stopped in 1530. The bell cage was actually a temporary solution, but the bells are still in use in the cage even now. Now, the idea of the devil dismantling the work is quite a common motif in English folklore, and if it's not the devil pulling down stones, it's fairies, as you often see in the legend of Kalali Castle. And in both cases, it's this idea that the human builders put the work up during the day, and then the devil or the fairies destroy the work at night. And this continues happening until the building is moved elsewhere. And I think this particular trope perhaps explains why a building's location was moved during the construction process, or why a building appears to be located somewhere that's not the most obvious place to put that kind of building. And we can't be talking about structural peculiarities and so on without mentioning famous steeples. Now this one I have mentioned before, but obviously you may not have listened to that episode. And it's around the idea that the traditional tiered wedding cake is actually based on St Bride's Church in London. Now according to the legend, there was a bakery at Three Ludgate Hill, and it had a fabulous view of St Bride's. And the baker apparently had an apprentice named William Rich, who had apparently fallen in love with Susanna, the baker's daughter. William wanted to make the most elaborate cake that he could to impress both Susanna and her father. And he happened to be looking out of the window and spotted the iconic steeple. The rest, as they say, is history. Now, it's actually really unlikely to be true because confectioners only started decorating cakes in the 1830s. And you can sort of hear more about that in the wedding folklore episode. But I wanted to include it just to show how... It's quite easy for people to make a link between something related to a church because they're often quite eye-catching because in some cases they can be one of the tallest buildings in the surroundings and then link it with something else. Now we've already seen the devil being blamed for a twisted spire in Chesterfield but he was also blamed for a tragedy at Widdicombe in Devon and a legend grew up that a man named Widdicombe Jan had made a pact with the devil. And the pact was Lucifer could have his soul if he fell asleep in church, which is a weird pact to make, but there we go. And naturally, one Sunday, he fell asleep, and the devil arrived during a storm to collect his dew. He smashed Jan against a pillar and then carried him off. And this legend was actually said to coincide with a storm on the 21st of October 1638, in which ball lightning and falling timbers actually killed four people and injured 12 more. One man actually died after being hurled against a pillar, which could explain the Widdicombe Jan story, and that over time this true event has then been turned into folklore instead. Now, an alternative legend did say that Jan was actually a gambler and sold his soul to pay his debts. And in this particular version of the story, he took a pack of cards to church and the devil turned up to carry him off. Jan was still alive when he was carried away and he dropped four races from his pack of cards near Birch Tor where it was said that you could still see four small fields where they fell. And of course just to wrap up this episode churches in their churchyards also performed a key role in various divinatory practices and one tradition called people to sit in the church porch on St Mark's Eve which is the 24th of April. And they would sit there silently between 11pm and 1am since the ghosts of those who would die the following year would then pass by the congregation into the church. This tradition was at its height between the 17th and late 19th centuries and it's largely believed to have been more common in the western north of England. And there are variations on the practice because for some people you had to repeat the vigil every year and then in others you just had to do it on three successive years. And some people also said that you had to walk around the outside of the church before starting the vigil, while others advised those keeping watch to fast while they were doing so. And of course, if you were single and wanted to know which person you would end up with, you could head to a churchyard near midnight on Midsummer's Eve, and at the stroke of 12, you would run round the church scattering rose leaves and rosemary, chanting, Rose leaves, rose leaves, rose leaves I strew, he that will love me come after me now. And then you should see a vision of your intended, although that may give you a fright in a dark churchyard. And I also found a specific version for young men. And they were advised to circle a church at midnight three or nine times, depending on the area, with a drawn sword, saying, here's the sword, but where's the scabbard, to see a vision of their intended sweetheart. And indeed, there were also other variations on this that you could run around various village churches seven times on a moonlit night, And then if you whistled through or peered through or dropped a pin through the keyhole of the main door of the church, you would apparently see the devil, which almost has a bit of an initiatory quality to it. 
So what do we make of this folklore of churches? Well, I've deliberately grouped these different types of tales into types so that we can see the kind of themes that run through the folklore of churches. And clearly there are far more churches with similar stories than I can include here. These are simply examples that illustrate wider tropes. We've got stories that explain architectural oddities, which probably have really mundane explanations that were never recorded. We've got the lost churches still ringing their bells either underwater or underground. And they act as a form of morality tale, reminding the world of what happens when spirituality is lost. And I think in some cases, the ones where the churches then slip into the sea, but continue to toll their bells underwater, that almost has a sense of the staying power of Christianity and spiritual belief and so on. Obviously, some of the tales do involve the devil bursting into the church to create havoc. And these tales can appear to mirror meteorological events and either those present didn't have the language to accurately process what was happening, or over time, the oral accounts have become embellished to create the legends that we have to explain them. And the devil really seems like quite an obvious choice of antagonist in these stories, setting him against the authority of the church. But I think for me, it's the divination that involves the church that tells us the most, because here the forms of divination are largely quite mundane, trying to find out who will die, obviously so that you can then make preparations for the loss of that person, particularly if they're one of the main earners, or indeed who will find love. And to be honest, obviously in years gone by, that's not necessarily like a burning desire for romance, but rather, especially for women, it was quite a pressing financial concern to then get married and start your own household. So I think that in those cases, the idea of performing that kind of divination where you would ultimately end up back at the church anyway, either for a marriage or a funeral, sort of makes sense that the church would be at the centre of it. And I think the idea of performing a divination to see the devil inside a church, to me, is kind of, it's a bit of an illicit thrill. And it's sort of like an early version of the urban folklore in which people run up to supposedly haunted houses to either peer through the window or the letterbox. But while the truth that explains apparently normal events has long since faded into obscurity, the law and legends preserve the old magic that has seeped into the church stones. And as we found with pubs last week, these stories do help to preserve local history, even if the link isn't immediately obvious. So what I want to know is, are there any cool folk tales and legends about churches where you live? Obviously, if you want to leave a comment, you can do so on the blog post that's attached to this episode and you can find the link for that in the show notes. Feel free to tweet me or tag me on Instagram if you've got photos of any of these churches because it's always really nice for me to see them as well. And that'll be really cool. So I hope you enjoyed that. Next week, as I say, we are looking at haunted churches and there's quite a lot of really cool stories around that. So yay. And if you are a Patreon supporter at the £3.50 a month or higher tiers, then the exclusive episode this month is actually going to be on the myths, legends and lore of Rosslyn Chapel, which if you've seen the Da Vinci Code, you'll know what I mean. And it's an absolutely fabulous place to visit. So I'm going to wrap things up there now because I don't know if you've just heard that my voice is literally just gone. So I'll, hopefully I'll have my voice back by next week. So have a lovely week ahead and I shall see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.